Well, welcome to church this morning. It's great to have you here. It's great to gather as family and worship God. It's great to celebrate the things that are happening in people's lives. I, I just get so excited um, hearing those testimonies. And may we never run out of testimonies. May we always have um, stories to tell about God and our lives and how we, we combine those two so they are seamless. It's, um, it's exciting to me. This week we had uh, many examples of um, people's lives being changed uh, as they surrender to the, the work that he's doing. Uh, people are engaged in the work that he wants them to do. Uh, people are engaged in the transformation that's happening. And um, for some, that's just stepping out in obedience and, um, what did Kathy say, putting your brave pants on um, and getting, getting across the chicken line and doing what God's asked you to do. Uh, it's not rocket science, but it takes obedience. And uh, for others, it's been stepping out in generosity As God leads them to that place of obedience, I'll share a little bit about that. But the phrase that I've used to describe that lately is the body of Christ being the body, doing what we're designed to do. And uh, uh, if I could get the next slide across, um, that'd be helpful, thanks. Um, We're in the middle of this season called Kingdom Abundance. And uh, my technology is not serving me well the last few weeks, so I'm going to rely on a nod and a wink to the back of the room. But what we're doing is we're looking at kingdom abundance in the context of our lives financially. And God asks me every year to speak on the financial principles that we find in the scripture. But it's really important that we understand the context in which Jesus speaks about these things. And if we look to the book, we get the guide for our lives. That's a novel idea. So that's what we're going to do today. If you could hit the next one, we've got the key verse for this series is found in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 29. Let me read it to you. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Today we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, the, the, the parable that Jesus tells And what we're going to do is we're going to unpack seven things that we can find in this parable that we would hopefully be able to adopt to our lives in different ways, depending on the stage we're at and the journey we're on. Seven things Jesus reveals in this parable that will lift us, elevate us into a perspective of kingdom abundance, remembering that it is our desire to see things the way God sees them. Before we jump into that, though, I thought... um, we would, we would do a little bit of an exercise. Uh, so Jamie's going to help me out here. What I need is four male volunteers. Uh, remember, we're quite into being voluntold around here. So um, the quick. You've got, you've, got, you've, got, you've, got, you've got three seconds. Okay, Jamie's going to... Oh, Francois coming up to help. Thank That's you. great. Cam's coming Cam. to help. That's awesome. Two more, Two more volunteers. Person, Bruce, here we go. Bruce is coming. And Brilliant. All righty. Excellent. Okay. So, so down here, down here. So we get the people nice and close. Come over that side. Two over that side. Two over this side. Maybe we could have the front house lights on, case so people can see what's happening at the front here. Because we've got basically what I want you to do. This is not a race, but I want you to take special care. And um, and so what we've got to do is we've got to, we've got to get you to apply uh, some lipstick in a way that looks good. I don't just want a mess, I want it tidy. Um, And there's also some eyeshadow. Uh, So um, you choose the colour that suits your complexion. Do you know how to open this? And so so you can share. One one does lipstick, the other does eyeshadow, and then swap, you know, because we don't want to ruin all my lipstick supplies at home. Um, You go. This is not a race, but you just don't want to... So you put put your lipstick on. Yeah, you put it on yourself. And you can do your own eyeshadow. um, Pucker up, boys. And I don't know if you're taking photos, Tanya, but this is, this is for the family at home. Um, Francois Scott, has done it before. Scotty, Scotty's doing... A, no, you've got to shut your eye, mate. Because eyelid. He's doing his eyebrows. It's not what, not what we want. It's like, oh, look, Cam's doing really well. Cam, Once you've done, done this done... before. It actually suits you. Actually, Cam has done this before, but uh, <laughs> that's the advantage of being in drama. So he, Once he's you've got... done your lips, swap for the so eyes. So you're taking a bit of time here. Why don't you swap and see how you go with lipstick? Um, because you're clearly not good at that. Um, <laughs> Kathy, do you want to... Um, where's your, so where's your helpful... Um, swap over. 
the Where's the um, support tools that we've got for these people? Where's the other one? Oh, no, he, he, he doesn't need one. They've both got them. Oh, they've got them? Yeah, they don't need them over the side. They don't? Okay. So this, if you can't see this is a mirror, it might make it easy for you to do your eyes. How are you going? Yeah, show, show me. Oh, I don't have Oh, you don't? No. Oh, come on, hurry up. We can't take yeah, all no, day. Yeah, you put it where you Swap. think it's got to go. How's yeah. it going with your eyes here? It's, oh, my goodness. No, it's got it on his cheek so far. <laughs> eyes? Yeah, oh, uh, eyelids, I think. Is that right? Girls, is it eyelids that you do? It's hard to see, eh? <laughs> hey, can you, he's looking good. We should auction these guys off soon. Eh? All right, okay. Got a date. <laughs> We've probably done enough here. So, have you got enough photos, Tanya? You got enough? Look. I think they're enjoying. He doesn't want to stop, does he? I'm trying to draw this to a close so we yeah. can move on. But anybody got foundation? Can you see what you're doing? Okay, Bruce. Have you got lipstick on? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so was that easy to do? Yeah. yeah. Easy, the lipstick was easy, but the eyes were a bit difficult. Yeah, you couldn't see what you're easy, doing. You your lips look fantastic. They really pop. That's amazing. Yeah. But your eyes, I can't quite see what colour you used. How are you boys doing? Oh, my. Scary. <laughs> you look like you got punched in the eye. Oh, <laughs> One's green and one orange. Oh, yes. The beautiful shade. Okay. <laughs> why, why don't you guys give these a round of applause, and I'll tell you why we're doing that. There are some wipes. Kathy's got it's wipes. It's always good to, to have fun too. as family, eh? Unless you want to leave it on. Hey, look, the, the reason that we did that was not just to embarrass them, but um, th- there are some makeup wipes. There's more if you need them. It's not easy to put makeup on, apparently, um, but more so, it's more difficult when you don't have a mirror to see what you're doing. Well, there are some that would be quite talented in doing that, I'm sure, if they had more practice. The point, the point of that was to do a contrast between those that had mirrors and those that didn't, but honestly, they're all just ugly, so um, there, was, there was no real benefit, it would seem, to having a tool in that case. But I, wanna, I, want, I, do, I do have a uh, purpose for doing that. Have I got all the lights on here? Can you see me? Okay. Um, so these tools here, we gave these out last week, and, and the reason I wanted to start like that was just to say that when we teach financial abundance, it's really important to us that we empower and equip you with the tools to use. See, giving Cam makeup without a mirror seemed to go well for him, but it certainly didn't go well for Scotty. Um, when I'm empowering you with, with the principles around kingdom abundance and finance and generosity, then it would be remiss of me not to give you tools to use that would equip you and enable you to be more proficient in that. And so last week we gave out this booklet called Generosity, A Guide to Giving. If you didn't get one last week, then uh, whilst I'm talking, you just catch the attention of our ushers who are floating around the back. And, um, and the idea is that they'll be able to help you because what I want to do is make sure you've got access to the, not just the information, but the tools to help. So just keep your hand up and wave them. I'm going to keep talking. You know, the message last week was all about making sure that we understood the principles behind the kingdom abundance. And I encourage you to catch the podcast if you haven't. It's available on our website. It's available on our Facebook page. It's available on the app that you can download for your device. So I want to make sure you've got access to the information because it's really important that you use it. If you could have the next slide up, I thought it would be really important also just this week to share um, this tool with you. This is also a tool that we made available last week, and this is what I call a self-assessment guide, where you look at this and you circle the words that may or may not stir in you when it comes to money and the Bible and what your life looks like. Now, I'm not going to dwell on this week, but I I do want to tell you that it is available online. Get it on the podcast, get it on the Facebook page, get it on the the app. You you can use this tool because the point of it is, as you believe in your heart, so it shall be. The point is not to keep you where you are, but to lift you above that place as we look at the principles in the Bible. If you have a look at the next slide, I want to show you some of the, or maybe click one more time, Some of the things that I've developed over the years, um, these two books here are part of my suite of books that I've written. The first book on the left there is called Becoming Money Wise, and I wrote this a long time ago. You can tell by the the photo on the back. Have a laugh at that later. But um, this this book essentially was written because I was traveling the country teaching people about money, and they were like, well, how do we we apply this on a day-to-day life? So I wrote the book. 
and the book teaches you how to understand what's important. It, it's got a chapter in there, how, how um, couples can stop fighting about money. There's a good one. Um, how to achieve goals, how to, how to get ahead in life. And it's all in this book. There's free downloads, there's, there's free resources, there's free videos on the website. Just Google Phil Strong Money Books and, and you'll find more information and some stuff. The, the other book called Kids and Money, how many of you parents would like to stop your kids treating you like an ATM? So this book I wrote for parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles and anyone who has um, kids around them in order that they would be able to demonstrate and teach principles that would encourage children to be good with money from an early age. And the beauty about this is there's two different authors in this book, so we both wrote our own perspective on the same chapter. You've got two different voices speaking to you, but the idea is that you you get some double input. I'm going to talk more about that at the end, but I suppose what I want to say is just how important it is to have access to the right tools in order that you can step into the way of living that God's designed for us. And so today I want to look at a parable in the Bible. If we click the slides, I've got a message called Seize Your Opportunity. And what I want us to do is I want us to look specifically at what Jesus teaches us in a small snapshot about kingdom abundance. And then hopefully you can apply that to your financial life. While this image of the ants is on the screen for you to ponder, let me just read to you the the words of Solomon. And this is why I chose this image. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 6, listen to this. Go to the ant, you sluggard. This is an older translation. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Observe its ways and be wise. It has no commander, overseer, or ruler. Yet it prepares its food in the summer. It gathers at the harvest what it will eat. How long, you sluggard, will you lie there? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to relax. And your poverty will come like a robber. And your need like an armed man. Solomon is basically saying, if you don't step up into the opportunities around you, you're going to miss, and in fact, poverty will overcome you like a bandit, like a robber. So today, as we look at this, think about your responsibility to seize your opportunity, and Jesus teaches us this in the passage we're going to look at today. Next slide is Matthew chapter 25. This is often called the parable of the talents. In some translations, it's called the parable of the three servants. Let me read it to you. If you've got a Bible, it would be good to look at it. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward. He said, Master... You gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Come, let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came. Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I couldn't have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. 
To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Lord, we pray that your word would guide us this morning, that your Holy Spirit would impart wisdom and revelation to us as your scriptures bring life to our circumstances, our way of thinking, and ultimately that we would be good and faithful servants. Amen. What's the background at the moment of looking at this parable? Jesus is sharing these words with his disciples. He's sitting on the side of a hill called the Mount of Olives, under the olive trees in the cool of the afternoon. As he often did, he would be speaking with his disciples and teaching them with stories. Just prior to this, prior to him telling the story, he's ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people have cheered and they've sung songs of praise and they've declared him to be the king, the Messiah, the one that brings hope. Jesus had a little bit of a moment of rage in the temple and made a whip and kicked some tables over and got a little bit frustrated. And he's been guiding his disciples in the ways of wisdom. You see, Jesus knows the end is near. His end is near. And there's an urgency in what he's doing. There's a particular purpose in the stories that he's telling. The beginning of Matthew 24, we see his disciples asking, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? They've got this paradigm that they were raised up with that is in fact not true. And Jesus tells these stories in order to help them to live well. So we're going to look at this passage and we're going to see the seven things that Jesus reveals in order that we would lift our understanding into what the kingdom of heaven would reveal to us. Let's look again at Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. If you could press the slide button, please. First point, we see here it says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He entrusted them some money while he was gone. The first thing that we see is that the master has left, and he is returning. What we've got to recognize is time is limited. If you refer to the previous parable prior to this text, it's the parable of the ten bridesmaids. And in that parable, Jesus makes it very, very, very clear that we must be urgently waiting in expectation for his return, and we must be prepared for when he returns. The parable speaks about the desire for us not to be lazy, but for us to be active while we're waiting. That's what this parable is showing us. Family of God, hear me when I say this, right at the outset, we must not be lazy, we must be active. That's what it's telling us. Do you have a sense of urgency around how you're spending your days before the King of Glory returns? Are you urgently seeking the things of God? Are you pressing in to understand what the Scriptures reveal to us in order that your life might be modeled on what they say? If anything, I hope today's message stirs you into a place of discomfort so that you know that time is limited and that you behave accordingly Let's work like the ant. Let's prepare while we can. Let's not be the sluggard that was rebuked by Solomon. Point number one is that we must remember time is limited. If you push the button for us, let's look at the next verse, verse 15. We see something else. Each servant is given a bag of silver. Now, in the Greek language that's used, In the traditional transcription of the Gospel of Matthew, the Greek word they used was talent. That's why it's known as the parable of the talents. And a talent is a weight of money, or weight of financial measure, and so the value of it depends on what you're weighing. A talent is equivalent to about 75 pounds or 34 kilos. In this case, we learn that they're given, this first guy's given 10 talents of silver. So that would mean 750 pounds of silver, 350 kilograms. That's a heck of a lot of money. So, so it's given to the servants. And to understand the context for this, 
and why the master is doing this, or in fact, why Jesus is saying that. We need to look at the text, but at a comparison text where Jesus tells a similar story. So if you're making notes, write down Luke 19. There's a parable of the 10 servants in Luke 19, and Jesus tells a story earlier to this on his way to Jerusalem. So it's a different occasion, but it's a very similar story. Jesus tells a story of 10 servants, each given one pound of silver, and the master has expectation that they will work hard while he is gone. Same sort of story. But we get a clue regarding Jewish culture when we look at the text in Luke 19. In verse 13, the master says, engage in trade while I am gone. So it's not just, here's money, I hope you're okay, I'll, go, I'll come back later. The expectation in the Jewish mindset and the culture is that the master was empowering them, enabling them with a gift, but there was an expectation that they would engage in trade while he was gone. One commentator of the scripture says this, the whole point of the setup in the story becomes this. The master says, get out there and do your best. You have limited time to prove yourself in the marketplace. On my return, I expect profits. See how much money you can generate while I'm gone. Make hay while the sun shines. That is the mindset that the Jewish person would have when they read the story that we're looking at today. There's a purpose for the bestowing of the gifts. We can see here that our resource is not earned by us, it's gifted to us, but it comes with an expectation. Let's not miss that. The, the, the expectation is that we would position ourselves in this opportunity, in this position of favor, with the gift bestowed on us, but that we would be responsible with the opportunity. The opportunity presented, you can see on the screen, this is our second point. The expectation is profitable activity on behalf of the master. The master is asking them to work hard for his name's sake and for the profit of his kingdom. What does this mean to us and what does it mean to you? Let's look at verse 16. The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. What does this mean to you? Jesus is asking you this question. Will you work hard for my name's sake and the profit of my kingdom? It's a serious question to ponder. I'm asking you to take it away and ponder it this week. Jesus asks you this question through the scriptures. Will you work hard for my name's sake And for the profit of my kingdom. Jesus draws us into an opportunity. I invite you to seize your opportunity. Let's look at the next one. Point number three. Let's read verse 18. The servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Not too good. What we've got to understand in the, in the Jewish age, the audience that are listening to this understand that uh, it's very, very dangerous times that they live in. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan, how the guy got beat up on the side of the road by robbers? Well, guess what could happen if you have a bag of money from your master and he's not here? There's a danger, there's a risk to you. There's a risk that you could get attacked by the robbers who hear about it and you get beat up or killed for the bag of money that's not even yours. So it would be much safer, rather than getting killed, to bury your money under the ground. Not a silly idea. Save your life, save your health, miss all the hassle. We've got to understand that with opportunity, there's risk. But with risk comes reward. Not all the outcomes were the same. Let's look at the master's response here in verse 19 to 21. After a long time, their master returned from his trip. He called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted five bags of silver came with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. See, I have earned five more. 
The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Come, let's celebrate together. What I want you to see is the reward that's promised is not what you would think it is. He's not praised for the profit, P-R-O-F-I-T. Many people teach this. In fact, I've considered before that the whole purpose of this parable is that we'd understand profit is what drives our activity. But it's not. Are they praised for how many bags they did? Read the look, read the book. Did they get, well done, you've made five bags of money? Was that what the scripture said? Are you following along? What were they praised for? Well done, good and faithful servant. You see, what's praised, what earns the reward of the master is faithfulness. It's not the profit at the end of the day, it's the faithfulness that counts. We're not based on the outcomes. What does this mean for you? Don't seek the accolades of men. Don't seek the praise of your friends. Don't seek the rewards that the world holds up as the prize of life. The true prize of life will come when we see the face of Jesus and he says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. How do you do that? Focus on developing your faithfulness. And I'll give you an idea on how to do that at the end. Developing your faithfulness comes through obedience to the task that he's put in front of you. See the opportunity, see the risk, and work for the reward of faithfulness. It's the most important point in the story. Let's look at number four. Let's read verses 22 and 23. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling the small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. I want you to note in the story that the reward of the faithful is not high privileges or gifts. It's not a bonus at the end of the week. It's not a holiday in the master's house in the south of Spain. It's not a cute little card with nice words written in it with a, maybe a, a gift card for Kmart in there. It's not what the master is promising. What do we see in the scriptures? The reward, press the button, the reward is greater responsibilities. That's actually the abundance that we're searching for. Not money, not profit, not things on this earth that could rust or decay. Jesus already taught us this in Matthew chapter 6. If you're writing notes, Matthew 6 verse 19 to 21. You'll recognize this when I read it to you. Don't store up treasures on earth where moth eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and could steal them. Store your treasures in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desire of your heart will also be. Jesus is showing us in the parable of the talents, there's a much bigger game at play than we might realize. It's not about the house you own, the car you drive. It's not about the status that you have with your friends or the the cash balance in your bank account. It's very, very clear in the scripture. In the age to come, when King Jesus returns in all his triumphant glory to rule on this new earth that will be established, the faithful servants will rule over cities. Why don't you look at your neighbor? Why don't you ask them? Will you be faithful? Will you rule over cities? Let's look at number five. You guys okay? Good. Before we look at the at the third servant, let's just make sure we pick as much as we can up from these first two, because our point. Number five today shows us the position we must take before the master, and it's not one of pride. As you can see on the screen, the position of humility is always appropriate. Did each of the servants say, hey, look how well I did, I've got five bags for you? They didn't say that at all. Read the text. 
verse 22. Let's have a look at verse 22. The second servant says this. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and now I have two more. Push the button. What's point number five? His gifts produce the fruit of our effort. The servant is saying, your gift, master, what you gave me. I didn't earn it, I didn't deserve it, I'm not clever enough, but your gift is what enabled me to produce fruit. We should always remember that. Your gifts produce the fruit of our efforts. It's not about strength, it's not about intellect, it's not about skill. Thank heavens for that. It's about the strength of God working through faithful servant. That's what pleases the master. Now, I need to remember this all the time. I must not rely on my work ethic, my commitment to the task, or my clever team. I must rely only on God. Now, when I rely on God, he will work through my work ethic. When I rely on God, he will work through my commitment to the task at hand in front of me. And when I rely on God, he will work through my clever team. But I must resist the distraction to put my trust in anything other than God who supplies The gifts of God bring the grace of God. And His grace is sufficient for me. The gifts of God bring the grace of God. And His grace is sufficient for me. As we arrive at point number six, it's time to turn our attention to the third servant, the final servant in this parable of Jesus. Let's remind ourselves what he says by looking at verses 24 and 25. The servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here you go, you can have it back. What of this final servant? What do we learn from him? Well, he's not called faithful, is he? He's not hardworking, he's lazy. We can see that he doesn't read the praise of the master. What can we learn from that? What we see, what we believe, is what we get. See, all of the servants in the story, they know the reputation of the master. They've all worked for him, so therefore they know him. It's not a surprise. The other guys know the same thing. All the servants know that he's a man with expectations. We can read, though, that the servant does not get the praise of the master. Let's read verses 26 and 27 just to remind ourselves what the master says. The master replies, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvest the crops I didn't plant and gathered the crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have got an interest off of my money. You see, the servant has this knowledge that I know you're a harsh master, and he takes that, responds in fear, and then acts out of fear. He chooses to believe what he thinks is true, and he bases his behavior on that, and he reaps the reward of that belief. But I'm suggesting to you, it's a false belief. He takes his twisted view of the master and behaves accordingly. See, what we see, the way we live, affirms our view of the master. What we choose to believe, what we choose to see, what we choose to believe is what we get. Now, that's a really serious point for you all to consider. The God you believe in is the God you experience. The God you believe in is the God you experience. Point number six is you, what you believe is what you get. If you believe God to be a harsh taskmaster, that's the way you're going to live your life. If you believe God to be a distant father, that's the way you'll live your life. If you believe God to be quick to punish and condemn, then you'll live your life without taking risk in any opportunity that he shows you. If you believe God is not to be trusted, then you're going to shape your life according to that. See, what this third servant shows us is something very, very important. The obstacles to intimacy with God are always self-imposed. Don't believe me? Let's read verse 30. Throw this useless servant into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
You see, there's a judgment for the unfaithful servant, and it's very, very clear. The consequences for his belief and therefore his behavior is that he gets to live and remain in that twisted view of the master. He believes that there's a harsh master that he cannot serve or please. That's the way his life plays out. He's got that twisted view. And so what the master says is, well, your consequences for your false belief is that you shall live in this this continued, distorted, disconnected view of me, your master. What you believe, what you see, what you choose to value is true. That's what you get. And so the third master, the third servant, lives in a place of loneliness and disconnection because that's the way he views the master. This is a moment for self-reflection. Does this concern you? Because your view of God is what's bearing fruit in your lives when it comes to kingdom abundance. I shared with you last week, before I can fix what's going on in your hand, your pocket, or even your head, I've got to invite God to fix your heart. And that happens through a spiritual transaction. If you're suddenly realizing you have an untrue, distorted view of God as your father, if you're feeling disconnected, then we need to change how we see God. In the story, there's no, there's no ongoing continuation. We don't know what happens, but I just want to remind you that God always responds when we repent. If we are in a place of false belief, if we are twisted in our view of the master and believe him to be harsh and, and not wanting to love us, then when we repent, when we lay those views down, God always responds and brings his truth into our lives. The greatest, the greatest, the greatest progress you could make out of that revelation is to put down false belief and pick up truth that God shows you. It will change your world, it will change your life, and it will change your finances. If you want prayer in that area, make sure you come and find one of the leaders after the service. I'll gladly pray with you, set you on a pathway. This brings us to our final point, number seven. The unfaithful servant teaches us something, and we see it on the screen here. No profitable activity leads to the absence of reward. Let's read verses 28 and 29 one last time. The master ordered, Take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. See, the key point here, push the button, the key point out of the series is to those who use well what they're given, they shall have an abundance, Jesus says. What have we learned from this parable? We must recognize that time is limited. We must have an urgency, a sense of urgency is required in these days for us as God's trusted servants. We must work in line with the master's expectation. Jesus is our master and faithfulness is the key that he's looking for. It is the master's desire that we would work in profitable activity for his kingdom in his name's sake. The reward will be that we are entrusted with more, more responsibility, more of God's abundance, more of his life, and it looks like greater stewardship responsibilities. Did you notice in the story, the guy who started with five talents, I call him the five talent guy, he ended up the story being the 11 talent guy. Ponder that. He'd grown in ability and favor and was trusted with more. People often ask me in the midst of this and the the wrestling and the desire to stretch and grow and be faithful to God, how do I grow personally? Well, here's the answer. It's on the next slide. If you desire to see kingdom abundance in your life, two things. Take on more responsibility and solve bigger problems. That's what the story tells us. It doesn't say sit back, relax, it's okay, the pastor will do it. Oh, it's okay, there's staff at church, they'll be right, they'll do it. it. doesn't say that at all. Step up. If you want to see kingdom abundance in your life, take on more responsibility and solve bigger problems. It's actually quite simple. It's not easy, but it's quite simple. As I dream with God in in relation to this, because I'm doing this as much as you are. I'm doing it. You can decide if you're doing it. But as I dream about the future of 
this church and how we engage and connect with this town that God's planted us in, I dream about what kingdom abundance might look like. In a practical sense, I mean. And here's, here's, what, here's what I see when I dream with God. Number one, increased responsibility in this town to meet the needs of this town. Number two, local influence with civic leaders of our region. Number three, open doors to new areas of the community we've not been in before. And number four, favor with decision makers to be able to bring kingdom love to people who need it. That's what I see. I wonder what you see. And I want to hear it. I do. Currently, I meet with people during the week because God stirs them in this area. They respond in obedience, come and see me, and all I do is find a way to help them get some momentum. It's been my intention this week, if we could look at the next slide, to share with you some targets for your activation of your faith. Highlight specific areas. Last year, I showed you a couple in Indonesia, and we shared their needs, and I'm so excited to tell you that people responded to that. We've funded their rent for two years. We've got money going towards the purchase of the land, and God is going to continue to provide through others to see them mobilized. That is a fantastic testimony to the faithfulness of the people of God. It's exciting. It's so exciting. What you see on the screen here is Rosetown Community Services Trust. What I wanted to do was draw your attention to something local. This is, if you don't know, the social arm of our church. This is our community trust that operates in the community and the region. The work we do on behalf of this trust is actually on behalf of the church. Currently, there's some key areas on the screen that we operate in. If you're not aware, we have a counselling centre. It's been going 24 years in Te Aumutu. We have nine counsellors on staff, others in the office, and we meet all sorts of needs from domestic violence, relationship counselling, children and play therapy, depression, anxiety, a host of other emotional and psychological and behavioural needs people have in the community. The counselling team do a fantastic job. Loving Arms was started a couple years ago. Shani wanted to help one mum with her baby, and that's blossomed into over 100 mums or babies' births that have been supported as the arms of Loving Arms get longer. We're going to see that grow and grow and grow. Ashley works in Tiamudu Primary School five mornings a week with kids who come out of disadvantaged homes. We call that Pathways. And we're partnering with Te Aumudu Primary and they are super excited about how we just get to love on these kids and help them feel safe so that they can learn when they go back to the classroom. We feed them breakfast, we do cooking days on Friday, Wednesdays is cooking days, we, we do learning activities, but the ultimate aim is to help the kids feel safe so they can learn from the teachers and not kill their classmates. That's a bonus, eh? This week... I have a meeting with a government department who are coming to Te Aumudu to find a partner who will work in youth justice. It's an open door that will increase our influence to help the young people in our community. And I pray and I ask you to pray for God's favour on that meeting. These are just four areas. Many of these areas are challenged and stretched financially. We run on the smell of an oily rag. If you're challenged to invest in missions locally, this is our local mission field. And Stu's not here today. He's got a back strain. But he's our treasurer of the trust. And in his absence, come and see me or phone the office and we'll connect you with Stu and you can talk to him about how you might want to step up in that area if that's what God's asking you to do. As I close... Just flick the slide across. I want to share something with you because you've been really well behaved and you're sitting nicely, so I've got, I've got a reward for you. On the screen, you'll see a summary of last week and this week. Last week, we learned that faithful sacrifice and faithful obedience are the keys for us stepping into abundance. You listen to that message online. This week, you can see profitable activity on, the prof- on the behalf of the Master is what Jesus desires. And when we do this, it will lead to greater stewardship responsibilities. At the beginning of today, I urged you to make the effort to use the tools that I provide for you. I don't just do this to keep me busy during the week. I don't develop the self-assessment guide on the website or the Facebook page just because I want something to do. 
I do it because I've given you a tool that can help you and your family to grow in this area in line with the Word of God. The generosity booklet we put together was at the request of our elders in order that we would, dis- we would disciple people in the area of financial giving and generosity. This is what we believe as a church. We make this tool available. I trust that you would use it. I talked about these books being available as tools. I suppose what I'm saying is the best way to lift people is to disciple them and empower them. To give them the tools that are available in order that they would rise above their circumstances, have a kingdom perspective, and and apply what God teaches us in his word. For the last 20 plus years, I've been educating people in this nation and other nations in the areas of financial stewardship, budgeting, debt repayment, goal setting, achievement, all those sorts of things. Because what I believe is when you empower people with sound financial education, you put teaching in their hands they have the best chance to rise above their circumstances and live the way God designed them to live. So, Kathy and I have decided, as an act of generosity to you, we're going to make these books available to you today. You get to choose which one you'd like for free. Now, this is one per family. There's no cost attached, no strings attached. You can come up after the service and choose which one you want. You can look at them before you make your decision. One per family, free of charge, because we're committed to you rising above your circumstances in order that you'd step into kingdom abundance because the the fruit of that is the town and the mission field being blessed by your obedience. We're trying to enable you to be faithful. We're trying to enable you to be obedient. So Kathy and Jamie are going to be one on each side of the stage. They've both got boxes of these books. You can just get choose. Take one home. And if you think you need both, find a friend and agree to exchange them when you're finished. All right? One free per household. I'll leave that with you. Let me close in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you having opened your word and received what you've got for us today. We ask that the seeds that have been sown today would bear much fruit for your kingdom. That we would be faithful servants that would apply the principles of scripture to our lives. That we would see the opportunities with eyes wide open and take the risk. Seek the reward of greater faithfulness and step into the opportunities you're showing us. God, I pray that the tools that are available to people would empower them and enable them to be all that you've called them to be. I declare the blessing of God over each family in our church community, that they would know the love of God, the Father who is good and gracious all of the time, that they'd know the empowering grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and how it elevates us above circumstances and empowers us beyond ability, and that we'd know the fellowship, the inner dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit our guide and counsel, the one who leads us in all things. Lord, I bless the people in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to get a book. Have a great week.